Hello everybody, welcome to another interview with one of our FTMO traders and today we're having Björn from Antwerps in Belgium. Hello Björn. Hello Vitek, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing very well and I think you too because uh, let me start off by mentioning that you had a very good month. Uh, in March you made about $40,000, is that right? On your yes. FTMO account? Yeah, okay. indeed. Okay, and also let me mention that uh, Björn here is uh, managing currently $400,000 and you haven't been trading with us for too long. You started trading in January, but uh, now, despite that, your results are already very, very good. So mm -hmm. that's why you're here today. But uh, let's go back a little and uh, can you give us a little introduction? So who are you and what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So my name uh, is Björn. I'm a full-time trader, uh, but also a mentor within trading. So I also guide uh, people with trading. Uh, but it wasn't always the case. So I first started trading when I was 16. 16 years old. 16. Yeah. Wow. But I didn't have any knowledge about the market. So I, I was just search, searching or browsing on the internet. How can I make money? And then there was a broker platform uh, on trading. So I just made a demo account, started doing some trades, didn't know anything about the markets. And yeah, I, I just started clicking and I made some money on the demo account. So it wasn't really uh, money, but just paper trading. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I came into contact with making money on such an easy way because I was just clicking a button. Then the eight years following on that process, I was just um, scaling small accounts into bigger accounts and then losing them all in once because my psychology was shit. Uh, my risk management was shit. And I was just actually gambling on the markets. Um, I was really trading. Uh, crude oil, this was a very volatile market, mm -hmm. always on the smaller time frames and just risking way too much. So I would always gain small amounts, small amounts, small amounts, and then one big amount, uh, a loss. So after eight years, I was just looking at my balance. So how much money did I actually make from trading or how much money did I actually lose? And it was around 80,000 in total that I lost. Ooh, after yeah. eight years. Yeah, after eight years. So it really was always like funding an account, um, making sure that I was just uh, gaining some money on the account and then I just lost it all. So most of the times so I would really scale my, account, my accounts from 4,000 to let's say around 20,000, 30,000 and I would just lose it all in one or two days. And that process would just go on and on and on because I was pretty stubborn and I really thought that I could make it mm -hmm. one day. Um, and then there was a point where I just really realized that I lost 80,000 in total. And there were two options for me. The first option was really uh, quit trading, never look back. And the second option was um, get a mentorship or get a mentor, really um, get someone who defines the playing field within trading. And then I came across my mentor, Armani Rojas de Kok. Um, I took a mentorship with him for one year. He really set out the playing fields, defining rules, uh, learning me about risk management. And at that time, that was a really important one to actually yeah, build a consistent trading plan, mm -hmm. but also a consistent trading uh, strategy with the right psychology uh, behind it. Okay, let me so, just uh, interrupt you there for a second. So you hmm? said, uh, you know, after eight years, you you, yep. you figure out what the total was, and then you decide to take a mentor. So during these eight years, you didn't have no mentorship. All of the information, uh, no. you were just doing a research yourself. Yeah, indeed. And it was in the earlier days. So now, at this moment, when you go at YouTube or Instagram or social media, you get really a lot of information about trading. But at that time, there wasn't really a information source for traders mm -hmm. or certainly not in Belgium. Um, so it was really just um, trading sentimental. So really on feeling, oh, the market goes down, let me buy, <laughs> the market goes up, let, let me sell. 
And I was also reading some reports coming from crude oil. You have the inventories uh, coming out, also some uh, data from the economic news from the USA. So I was always counting on the news events, mm -hmm. which were really volatile, really um, high risk. And yeah, it was always scaling the account with small amounts and then just losing it in one time. Mm, okay. So uh, how long did it take for you to shift from, you know, uh, being, uh, being a trader who lost $80,000 in total or 80,000 mm -hmm. euros uh, to a profitable trader? How long did this process take? Well, actually not that long because um, my mentor was actually pretty hard to me, uh, which was good. So one of the first calls I, I was talking to him and I said like, um, yeah, I, I moved my stop loss a little bit. So I, I was playing with my stop loss mm -hmm. and there was like a silence of, I think, even 30 seconds, really a big silence. So I, I thought like, okay, the internet connection failed or <laughs> there is something frozen. And he really uh, looked me in the eyes and he said, if you do this one more time, I will give you back my money, uh, your money, and I won't mentor you. You can mm. just leave. Because these are the rules. You need to follow them. If you don't follow them, I don't want to work with you. So it really snapped. And from that moment, I really uh, considered always following the rules and really creating a playing field for myself. And it took me like four or five months after I was in the mentorship with him to actually be profitable. Now, was it profitable like the biggest profit each month? No, but it was consistent. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any uh, big losers anymore because my rule was very simple. Stop loss, risk management, and that's it. Okay. Uh, during this time when you were taking a mentorship, were you working as well? Or uh, were you like full-time focusing on trading only? Uh, no. Uh, at that time, I was a owner of a social media agency or a digital marketing agency. So I actually ran a business for uh, three years, starting from um, September 2019. Mm -hmm. So during COVID, really worked uh, quite a lot to actually scale the business. So I was full-time a business owner. And beside that, I was following the mentorship and also full-time uh, or trying to be a full-time trader. And I managed to be a full-time trader because I scaled my business pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I could sell the company for yeah, quite some money. Mm -hmm. So I was really settled for the next coming years. So I didn't have any financial mm, stress. So I could trade also like pretty relaxed. Okay. Yeah, I think that's also another important factor because if you're trading because you know you need to make money, right? Mm -hmm. It's a completely different pressure that you have on yourself. Yeah, indeed. Uh, indeed. So uh, that was also a rule of mine. Uh, whenever I became a full-time trader that I needed to have some really liquid cash on, on the side to be... For example, if I don't make money for the coming four years... I can still live, I mm -hmm. can still do groceries, I can still pay for my car, I can still pay for my uh, petrol. So uh, I don't have really the stress that I have to make money. Um, I see a lot of guys really trying to go full time and they have to make money every month and there is really a lot of stress involved mm -hmm. uh, within their, their trading. So the psychology within those guys are, are sometimes messed up because they have uh, FOMO, um, sometimes there are months that the market doesn't give you so many opportunities and then it's very difficult when you need the money from trading mm -hmm. all right now let's shift uh more towards the trading itself so uh i've noticed that you're trading forex you're trading yep. quite a lot of pairs actually and uh, that's yep. something that we do not see too often because so many traders say uh, you need to focus at one, two, three pairs mm -hmm. and and master it i've noticed that you're trading more than just one or two um yep. So uh, has it been always like this? Well, if, if you compare it, you know, to, let's say, like five years ago, uh, was your approach to trading <clears> the same? Or were you before like, uh, you know, now you trade within a day or sometimes you hold a position overnight as well. Mm -hmm. So has mm -hmm. this been the same for the past years? Um, 
for the past two years, yes, it has been insane because then I had the mentorship, the strategy from um, my mentor, and then it's really swing trader, uh, swing trading. So then I just trade every pair on my watch list, and it is actually almost everything, uh, every forex pair within the majors. So we have the New Zealand dollar, Australian dollar, pounds, euro, yen, uh, DXY. Uh, but also gold, silver, and even uh, crude oil. Mm-hmm. So the, the our strategy is applicable for all those uh, pairs, and I, I will trade them all. Um, but I have a very strict trading plan, so there isn't really an opportunity for each pair every month. Mm-hmm. Okay. And last question before we move on to the strategy: How important are fundamentals and and use in your strategy? Uh, none. None. So purely no. technical. Yeah. All right. Purely technical. Um, the only thing I'm looking at uh, for the fundamental is just I'm aware of the news events. So mm-hmm. the, the major news events like CPI, uh, NFP, like today it's NFP, um, and the interest rates. Those where the markets are really volatile, uh, then I'm just careful managing my uh, trades. Um, and not taking any risks, but uh, I'm not looking at any fundamental news to take any trades. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so let's see how it's done. All right. And here we have uh, New Zealand dollar and Canadian dollar open. So, uh, yeah, that's another uh, another uh, symbol that is not that popular, but obviously works well for you. So, so yeah, go mm-hmm. ahead and show it, show it to what, uh, what trade you make. Yeah, so um, with every trade, I'm always using top-down analysis to really look at the higher time frames and see what plays in the markets. So on the higher time frames, the thing I want to make sure of are two things: um, support, resistance, and where does the price come from or where, where does it react from? So actually, my big support line was actually here because price was reacting last month from this zone then i always zoom out and just look at the history so what can i see from here every time the price was touching this zone we always had a very big move to the upside a lot of liquidity is actually on this big zone Um, same for the sellers so whenever we are trading under this um, support or supply and demand zone, we get a lot of liquidity to the downside. So for me, this was the first sign and the first time that my bias was actually prepared for longs. Mm-hmm. So here on the higher time frames, I always prepare my bias to see where does markets want to go. And for me, that was to the upside. Then the second part is market structure. So I'm always looking at higher highs, higher lows, and looking how is market forming. So for the last couple of months, we were actually very, or last year, we were very bearish. This is the high, low, high, low, high, low, new high, new low. And here we broke it very impulsively. So that's the second thing that I'm also looking within the market structure is impulse and correctiveness so we always find the impulse to the downside and corrective to the upside impulse to the downside corrective to the upside again big impulse and correction now whenever i see a switch of market which happened here my bias also changes Mm -hmm. because we got a big impulse to the upside and we got a correction to the downside so again, just the higher time frames. I'm looking, um, yeah, for to really have a bias to see whether I'm looking for buys or for sales. So at this moment, everything plays for me to look for buy setups. Then I'm going to the weekly time frame. Now, the weekly time frame was a little bit similar than the um, the monthly time frame. Just one small detail for the weekly time frame. We received a very nice three leg um, correction. So we got a very big impulse, 
we have a tree lake correction. So let me just. Then I always expect markets to break these highs, come back, and push higher. Most of the times this happens, it's like a fake out flag. And this was my bias for the weekly. Then another thing that happens, we also use our uh, Fibonacci tool. So whenever in the uh, correction, I have the impulse, correction, impulse. When I take my FIB tool, and we're using the levels uh, 61.8 and 87, uh, 78.6. And we have the minus 27. It's actually an extension or a fit completion, so we call it, to actually see where uh, sellers will take profit. And what can we see? It really matches our big supply and demand zone. Mm -hmm. And what happens is actually whenever we hit our minus 27, we got a bullish indicational candle and a continuation of the bulls that week. So again, this really confirms my bias to take long setups. So that was my part on the higher time frames. Then I go to my daily time frame. And on my daily time frame, what I'm looking at is actually also again market structure and the nature of the market. So when I was looking at the past here, we're really in a bearish momentum. Also here with the high, low, high, low, and again, always the market structure. Then following the impulsiveness and corrective, you have the impulse, correction, impulse, correction, and impulse. So what really triggered me are two things. The impulses were getting smaller and smaller. And the second thing, we were actually reacting on this structure. We call it an institutional candle. It's actually a bearish candle with a lot of uh, bullish candles in them because it makes some structure. And for us, it really works as a magnet. And as you can see, market was really drawn into it. And here we got really the change of character of the markets. So we received a break of structure here, this moment. Then the first trade I can take is a reverse reversal pattern. So actually, the first trade I can take is the inverse head and shoulder. Why? Because the market structure shifts from a bearish momentum into a bullish one. Because where is the impulse coming from? Actually, from this zone, very big impulse to the upside and receive a correction. So the first trade I was looking at was actually this one, where we received shoulder one, the head, and shoulder two. Now, there was an opportunity on the four hour, but I wasn't tagged in, so I won't go over that one. And mostly after we receive a reversal pattern, we receive a continuation pattern, like this one. And that was forming here on a daily time frame. So we have our reversal pattern, and then we have the bullish gem. Bullism is always in five legs. We have the one, two, three, four, five. So one of my rules is for a bullish M to trade, we need to make higher highs and higher lows. So that one was checked. Mm -hmm. Then my third leg has to be impulsive because I really want to see that bulls are in power. So here we have a very big impulse. Then what I do is I take my FIP tool from the higher high into the higher low. So the FIP, I will just delete this one. And then I place already my take profit. And the minus 27 again is my take profit level. So it's a daily TP. 
So there I will search for profit. Then I need to define my daily zone. And how do I define my daily zone? Very simple, I'll always do it the same. I put a horizontal line on the 61.8, and then I just go down into the first structure. Where can I find the first structure? It's actually here. So place my daily zone. And then that's something very important for the psychology. I always wait until the markets come to me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to chase the market. So this was my preparation. I think it was on a Monday or a Tuesday. Let me see. Uh, even this was on Wednesday, but I already did it on Tuesday because I got my first retrace candle. So I was already prepared to take this trade. The only thing that needs to be happen is the touch of this zone. So what happens? Bam. There is a touch. Yeah, there is a touch of the zone. Then I can go to the four hour time frame because there I will take my entry level. So I will just rewind to the touch of the zone. This one. And then one of my four entry criteria is we have uh, deceleration. And what is deceleration? We just want the market to slow down. When do we want the market to slow down? Whenever we got a big impulse to the zone. So this is pretty impulsive. And we really want to wait until we know for sure that this zone is respected. So the weight of this zone, I need to have three candles that actually respect the zone. And in those three candles, I need one blue candle because I need to be seeing that the bulls are present. So again, I get the touch of my zone. Then I can look at the four hour. And now I have to wait until I have a blue daily candle, a uh, four hour candle. What happens? Pots. So we receive the first one, second one, the third one. Then I will place my position on the body of those candles. After the close, of this bullish one, place my stop loss underneath the highest wick, and I'll just add 10 pips. Then my take profit will be on the daily TP, risk to reward of 4.8%. Then what happens? I was tagged in. We received some deceleration. And then I was looking for a scaling because on the two hours we were forming actually a pretty nice uh, pattern, a pattern within a pattern. We had first one, two, three, four, five, and we were also receiving shoulder one, the head, and shoulder two. So here I took. A second position, I think it was around here. Stop loss was beneath this structure and also added 10 pips. Again, take profits on the minus 27. Add some drawdown, but no stress. Then on Friday, the market pushes. And it hit my daily TP. Now, they are very important also for the traders. Don't be greedy. Always take out um, yeah, the profits because what happens after hitting the minus 27, we came down back to our break even level. Um, so, this was the trade that I took the, the first one and the scaling. And I think combined. Uh, netto, I had uh, I made twenty percent on on those uh, uh, ten percent on those uh, on those both trades. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a very complex stop analysis. I mean, uh, you've prepared to set up days before you even took the trade, right? Yeah, uh, that's indeed. Not something that you know, we'd be seeing too often here. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, comes to the risk, uh, how do you calculate it? 
Uh, well, I always go to my fixed book, then, um, then I calculate with the pips, and then I set my uh, stop loss. And normally I use like 1%, sometimes 1.5, 1.25, uh, because I'm very comfortable with my uh, strategy. And also I'm a swing trader. I don't take a lot of trades. Um, as you can see, um, sometimes really waiting for the markets. Um, but I really like this style of trading because I only need to spend like one hour a day um, to trade. So I always do my market breakdown at 10 uh, in the evening. Then I will look, I will go over all pairs. And as you can see, it's pretty complex. Um, I need to have a daily pattern. So my daily pattern was here, my uh, bullish M. And I need to wait until this zone is hit. So I will just place an alarm on several pairs. And whenever the alarm is hit, I can go over to the four hour uh, time frame. So it's really not um, like, I don't have to put in a lot of work or a lot of stress. Um, and yeah, for me, it's a really great way to trade, to actually have a lot of freedom uh, because I can do a lot of things uh, besides trading. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have the stress of or, or the emotions because um, I always need the market to come to me. Then I place my limit order and I step away from the markets. So I don't have to spend a lot of time on the charts. Mm -hmm. So that's something that works uh, for me. Okay, so you set the limit order and yep. uh, then you just let the market do its thing. <clears throat> it's not like yep. you would be watching the screen at all times. Uh, no, because actually there are two things that can happen. Or we go to take profits or we go to our stop loss. That's it. You can't actually do anything as a trader. Um, the, the only thing that I will do is whenever I hit a certain level, of profits, then I will just place my stop loss to the entry or a little bit above um, that I have a break even. So whenever the markets come back to my entry point that I don't have a loss, but I just a break even. So that's the only action I can actually do. And um, something we say is we did our job, then it's the markets who decides or the markets has to do their job and that's it. So we just wait and um, try to have as less stress as possible. Yeah, I mean, in the end, you know, watching the, the market live will most likely bring you nothing but stress if you see, you know, the, the price going against your direction. Yeah, um, indeed. Do you sometimes do partial closes or do you always close the whole position? Uh, well, uh, I did in the past. In the past, uh, I had some partial closes. Uh, the thing what I do now is actually I try to work with a trading stop. So whenever, let's say in a four hour time frame, but here I did a full close on the daily TP, uh, but whenever the markets, and I will just, just draw it. So whenever my entry is at this level and on a four hour time frame, just making these moves to my take profits. First, I was just taking out two thirds of my positions, let's say on beginning of correction or the minus 27. The thing what I do now is I just put my stop loss always under the structure mm -hmm. because I want the price to stay bullish at all times. So we're just moving my stop loss to the next structure. I already know that I locked in some profits. And whenever the markets try to shift and come back, it will just yeah hit my stop loss, but I will close my, my full position. And I like it that way uh, because as a trader, you want to pay yourself out. Mm -hmm. All right. So you do move your stop loss, but only to the positive direction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not in the negative one. All right. Um, except for the Fibonacci tool, is there anything else that you like to use? Some some no. Migdi or any other? Nothing like no. that? All right. No. Only clean charts. So really naked charts. Just uh, the Fib tool that we use to really define our, um, our correction and our take profit. Uh, but that will be it. So no, uh, no other indicators, uh, only using price action. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for how long have you been using this uh, sort of setup? So, so clean charts, you know, just only marking the important zone. Uh, for, long, for how long has this been working for you? Uh, this has been working now for two years. 
and I really like it uh, that way. So I really like my charts to be clean, um, not a lot of distractions, and just using yeah, supply demand, uh, market structure, and impulsiveness, correctiveness. And then we have just our patterns with certain rules. And I always, always try to do the same so that I don't actually have to think. Um, I just have to execute my trading plan. Mm -hmm. All right. And are you using this approach also to other asset classes other than Forex? Yeah, you can you can use it uh, for, let's say, gold, uh, also uh, use oil, silver. Uh, we also do it sometimes on crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, XRP, uh, but most likely the bigger uh, coins. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And let's now just have a quick look into your account matrix. And also finally here in your account matrix. So uh, as we can see, this is one of your accounts uh, where you yep. made uh, $24,000 on the other one. Uh, you had uh, something over $16,000. And one thing I noticed while checking your accounts, uh, the balance curve was very, very similar. So are you copying your trades from one FTMO account to another? Yeah, yeah. I'm always using uh, the same trades because it's my trading plan. Um, it would be strange to actually not uh, copy my trades or yeah, execute the same trades for uh, the other uh, um, accounts. So for me... I'm very integral to my trading plan. Whenever I see a setup with this in within my trading plan, I will and I need to execute them um, because otherwise I would just play with the numbers game. And yeah, I'm really confident about uh, the trading plan as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, judging by the balance curve, we can see that nothing probably really went off your plan. It's a pretty nice and steady growth. We can see that all the losses were not that uh, not that uh, significant. So mm -hmm. everything went according to the plan. Now, if you could please scroll down uh, to the trades themselves. So we can see there's not too many of them. So you did no. about, what, 10, 12 trades, oh, something like that? Yeah, 14. 14, 14 total. Yeah. Okay. Another thing, very nice win rate, 71%, and positive risk reward. That's something that's not too often we see it either people having high win rate and low risk to reward or vice versa high risk to reward yeah. but low win rate and yeah. this is uh one of the rare examples where we actually see both so yeah uh, well done well, well for example because you also see some smaller wins and those trades are actually break even trades so like for example uh let's see this one so i had a buy on uh aussie us dollar so it went well, it went above like one to maybe 3%. And then I will place my stop loss just a little bit um, above the break even level. So whenever the trades come back to my break even level, I would just have a really small win. So that's why the, the, the win rate is that high and also the average risk reward is uh, pretty low. So that's how I, I, how I always manage my uh, trades. And I just had actually two big winners. We had the New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar, and this one was uh, the Aussie one, Canadian dollar. So those both uh, combined. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you have uh, a target that you want to go for, for example, for 10% a month or something like that? Or is just how it goes? Yeah, it's how it goes. Um, in my experience, setting a target is uh, setting up for failure. Um, because it's it's again something psychological. You're putting a pressure uh, on yourself. Yeah, already. you're putting a pressure, and, and that's something as a trader you don't want to do. You just want to flow with the markets. Um, whenever the markets give you something, um, then then you need to enter. Sometimes there are months that the market isn't just giving something for your plan, um, and then setting up expectancies for the end of the month will get you into getting into trades. Mm -hmm and risking maybe more than you have to, um, to actually get to the target. Um, so I, I aim for 5% a month. That would be very nice. Uh, but I don't set any expectations on the profit levels. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we can talk a bit more about that in the last part of the interview, which is going to be about the psychology. All right, psychology, it's a big topic among traders, and that is also why we talk about it here uh, in our interviews. So uh, you've been mentioning that psychology is 
maybe like 50 60 70 percent of trading so uh how did you or how did your psychology develop from the beginning up until now i mean what were the hardest obstacles for example psychological ones that you had to overcome on your trading journey mm -hmm. yeah in the beginning of my trading journey i was really expecting the quick reach uh the get quit a quick rich scheme so that actually I was just calculating in my spreadsheets whenever I make 1% each day, I will get yeah, amazingly exponentially rich. going up. Yeah, 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 indeed. So the compound effect uh, of the interest and it was just not being patient. I wanted to be rich the first month of trading uh, after one month, after two months. So it's really the, the consistency and um, actually looking at trading as going for the long run and actually uh, the thing that really switched my mind was my mentor said, you have to look at trading as your business. And whenever you make a loss, um, it's actually a business expense mm -hmm. for your trading. Mm -hmm. So that was something that really got into my mind. And also within business, you always try to be consistent within your actions. And you don't expect to really go from zero to yeah, actually the moon or millionaire within uh, one month so the expectancy to actually get really rich at a high pace uh, really get into you so you want to overexpose yourself in the markets you want to risk uh, more percentages than you have to you want to go into trades there's really a lot of fear of missing out and it's just there are so many days in a year so many opportunities in a year to actually trade and that was for me, the most difficult part, actually, because uh, within trading, when you don't have any rules to follow, the playing field is like really free. Uh, anyone can just open an app, put in thousands uh, euros or dollars and put in a trade anywhere, everywhere with how many lots. There is no playing field really defined. And that's something really difficult, uh, psych mm -hmm. psychologic. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I heard somebody say, you know, you cannot play the game if you have no rules. There always need to be some rules in order, you know, for the whole thing to have uh, to to make sense. Um, mm -hmm. do you think uh, the thing you mentioned that you were expecting to get rich so quick? Uh, do you think this uh, is now more common than before? Because, for example, I remember, like, let's say, ten years ago, uh, I haven't seen you know uh so many so many mentors or so many so many ads on forex you know and now mm -hmm. of course you have the on instagram you know everybody uh flexing the the lambos and stuff like that and go ahead and try uh, forex and you'll be rich like mm -hmm. me so do you think uh people have this problem now even more than they used to have it before you know expecting okay i'm gonna make millions in, in a month yeah, of course. I think there is really a lot of false advertising within the financial space, um, not only with Forex, also with crypto. Um, a lot of people, communities are actually making money on yeah, selling the dream, not mm -hmm. really um, really mentoring or actually telling the truth. So the, the get, get rich quick scheme, um, they are present uh, now and a lot of young guys are actually falling into it and maybe i would do the same whenever i was young uh, because you're hungry you're young you just want to make money and if there is an easy way we as people we want to do we always want to take the easy road so i think it's very common that a lot of people will get trapped within those get rich quick schemes but mainly trading and every experienced trader on your platform will say that trading is actually really a business and, and it's really on the long run. You need, to have, you need to be professional, consistent and really define your rules um, on the playing field to actually um, yeah, be consistent in the markets. Because it's one thing to have profits one month, but you need to make profits each month or each year. You just need to be consistent. And that's really a work on, on the long run. I think the the people are saying like well, within three months you can be consistent and you can trade and you can make a lot of money you're already full of shit because you need to have some experience uh, in the markets you really have to control your emotions you need to learn the psychology game 
you need to learn the technical game. So it's really a um, a business, and I always try to compare it with high income skills, like uh, for example, a lawyer or a doctor or an astronaut. They also have to go through school for uh, seven, eight, nine years. So why would we expect as a trader that we can learn it in one or two months? So I think as a trader, if you can learn the skill on a consistent level within one year, two years, that you can be very, very happy about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like the way you said that losses or you got to you gotta perceive losses as as the business cost, right? Because uh, then, of course, you, you can never have a business where you have zero cost, right? And I think if you if you look at your losses that way, then mm -hmm. it it is easy for you to you know to and um, actually you know take a loss of course it shouldn't be yeah. it shouldn't be it shouldn't be too easy but uh but yeah if you perceive it like okay it's it's some necessary sort of expense and mm -hmm. you can never trade and have no losses uh then Indeed. taking a loss it's maybe not gonna have you know that much of a negative impact on on yourself yeah the, the way i look at it is um for example, my trading plan, I backtested it for years. So I have data collected within a big spreadsheet with all my wins, all my losses, all my break even. So I know for a fact that my trading plan is profitable. And I know for a fact that also within my trading plan, I have losses. So it is part of my trading plan. So whenever I take a trade, I always go over my trading plan and my criteria. So I all always ask myself four questions. And the first one is, is my weekly time frame uh, clear, yes or no? So whenever the answer is yes, I can go to my daily time frame. And is my daily pattern within my criteria of my plan? When the answer is yes, I can go to the four hour time frame. And then in the four hour time frame, I will just ask myself the same question. Is my four hour time frame criteria matched, yes or no? So whenever I have three yeses, then I ask myself the uh, last question, and it is if a AI or a trading bot has my plan. I would really spend a lot of money to actually uh, make a trading bot that has my plan mm -hmm. uh, because I know my results. Would it take the trade, yes or no? Whenever the answer is yes, I just need to take the trade. So whenever the trade goes to a take profit, then I just know. All right, that was my plan, well executed, good trade. Whenever it goes to my stop loss, then I know it is a good trade, well executed, but the market decided to do something else. And whenever I have like two or three losses in a row, I just go back to my backtesting system and look at my data. And I just look like, um, how many times does it happen that I have three or two losses in a row? Well, it happens quite a lot. So it reminds myself, that my trading plan again is working. So the fourth trade, I just have to take it again mm -hmm. as my plan said, because most of the times the fourth trade will be a winner. And if the fourth trade isn't a winner, then I take the fifth trade again as my plan said. So I always put the responsibility of the trade, not on myself, not on my uh, person self, but on my trading plan. So the responsibility is not me, it is my trading plan. So I have to be at all times be integral to my trading plan because I know my data of the of the trading plan. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in the end we could summarize it that you also need to have realistic expectations, you know, from what you get. Uh, yeah. As you mentioned, it you can have the setup might be correct, you can have your strategy back tested, everything perfect, and still it happens that the market simply is not going to follow the plan and is going to do something else, and that's yeah. something that you need to count on. And if it's yeah. going to happen, you know, the the worst thing that, that you could do is probably say, "Oh my God, okay, it's, everything is wrong. I need to I need to start from scratch and and start yeah. and create a new strategy all over again." Uh -huh. Yeah, correct. All right. Um, do you think uh, currently so? Uh, let me just uh, go back a little. So, so for how for how long have you been trading? About ten years. Ten years now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think there are still some things from the psychological point of view that uh, you need to get better at? Mm, yeah, of course. I think. Um, yeah, 
I know one thing that I have to be better at because my results would be a lot better even uh, last month if I wasn't too greedy. And sometimes I will place my stop loss a little bit too tight because I look at the risk to reward to my uh, to my take profit. Mm -hmm. It happened two times uh, within uh, last yeah last month. It was a, a trade on euro uh, yen and a trade on pounds. Uh, Switzer, uh, Switzer's frame, um, and both went to actually 9% in profit, but I just put my stop loss a little bit too tight. I was just kept out by one or two pips, and then it really went up. So that's something uh, I still need to work on is uh, greed and actually place my stop loss a little bit more conservatively. And it is just looking at the numbers and expecting market to go there. And um, yeah, it, it those are really small details, but it cost me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, I have to work on them every day again and again and again. I have to remind myself again and again and again that I need to follow my rules. Because not following my rules is the highest cost of me as a trader. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to end this interview. So uh, thank you, Bern, so much for being here. I think uh, we talk about so many important things and that uh, you've shared a lot of lot of knowledge so uh thank you and if there is something that you would like to say in the last words now is our time yeah no i want to thank uh, ftmo also for the opportunity to have this interview just want to give a small shout out to uh, armani my mentor uh, but also the forex dictionary which is the community um, of uh, armani and also where i work and I think there is a, a really great future for retail traders, uh, also with the funding firms. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and that's FTMO. <laughs>